connecting the system, we're looking at transport across the membrane. Here at our syllabus dot points, we have already covered the description of what a cell membrane looks like. All right, so we've discussed the structure of the cell membrane, um, and we can use this knowledge to learn how this membrane is selectively permeable. So it's allowing those different substances to come and go when required. That permeability is required for a cell to function and perform all those basic requirements for life. It's got to get those nutrients in and it's got to remove waste as well. So that selective perme uh, selectively permeable means it's going to depend on what it needs at the time and how the substances enter and exit the cell. It's not always going to be letting in the same types of molecules or letting out the same types of molecules. Right, there are two kinds of transport across the membrane that we are going to focus on, active and passive. So if you talk about passive transport, it's kind of just happening based on a concentration gradient. If it is active transport, however, ATP or energy is required to work against the concentration gradient. So there are two main differences, energy is required versus no energy required in passive. Here's our types that we're going to be speaking about, and here are the types we'll talk about in active transport. Now, before we start, we've got to understand what a concentration gradient actually is. And it's about the distribution of particles across a space from high concentration to low concentration. Now, substances will travel always from an area of high concentration to low concentration. That is what the concentration gradient means, right? The gradient from high to low. If you spray perfume in one part of the room, the molecules of perfume that you can smell in the corner will eventually diffuse out from an area of high concentration to spread out to the area of low concentration. Let's start talking about passive. Passive transport and our first one is diffusion and diffusion is the spreading out of particles with the concentration gradient from areas of high to low concentration, right? It exactly follows the concentration gradient. You can see that there that the solute, the red blobs within the blue solvent uh, molecules are spreading out exactly as you would imagine, say that, that perfume example. Right, now things that might impact how quickly this process actually happens include temperature, right, um, the steepness of a gradient, um, it's not going to work well, um, you know, if there's way more particles on one side of the gradient, obviously it's going to be different, um, and the molecule size as well, they are passing through that membrane, so it's going to matter how big and how easily accessible that cell is. You can see here that we're talking net flow, so when those uh, particles actually start to move, it's not that none of the ones on the right will come across the cell membrane, it's about more of these ones coming across that way. Now, if we talk facilitated diffusion, it's still a type of passive diffusion, but the center of the membrane is hydrophobic. So any positive or negatively charged ions in solution are going to struggle to get through that um, membrane. So there are protein channels to facilitate. Essentially, it's just a big open tunnel that allows those charged ions to go through. So cells actually still control which type of channels they can make. So they might be smaller to allow for some molecules and larger to allow for bigger molecules. Um, and they can control what protein uh, are embedded in their membrane. So they can control what ions diffuse in. But again, you've got to remember this is still a passive process. Now, osmosis is the movement of water across a concentration gradient. It's diffusion, but for water. Water is usually the solvent, and it's far more mobile than the solute. So in this case, the solute are the green blobs. The water molecules are moving back and forth. And remember, this is about the net movement. The net movement, you'll see that even though the water will be moving mainly from left to right, there will be water molecules that pass from right to left as well. So the water will pass between phospholipids, right? Not well, but there are aquaporins, which are protein channels that can be used for the bulk of the movement. Now they can go down single file, right? Uh, but because of that internal part of the channel being hydrophilic, it's fine. All right, let's talk about active movement this time. Remember, energy is required for this type of movement. We have carrier proteins as opposed to those channel proteins. And this is transporting ions and things like molecules across the concentration gradient, which means if it's putting out sodium this way and it's putting out potassium that way, it means there's actually more sodium up here already and it's working against the concentration gradient. When the ions enter this protein, the protein actually changes shape to allow the ions to exit from the other side of the membrane. So it's kind of like when you get into an elevator in one way and the doors open behind you when you get out. It's obviously much slower, but it's very specific compared to, say, diffusion or some kind of protein channel. 
Uh, axons in nerves do this with sodium and potassium to create a nerve impulse. Right. Endocytosis is transporting really large things that don't necessarily fit through a protein channel. This might be antibodies, it might be food for digestion or bacteria for a white blood cell to destroy. And this is going to occur due to the fluidity of the membrane. You can see the phospholipids in that membrane right there are actually reconfiguring to suck something in and then take it back into the cell. So the membrane opens up and then restructures itself. Phagocytosis is cell eating, okay, versus pinocytosis, which is called cell drinking. And you can watch this. This is a type of white blood cell that is chasing around a bacterium in the bloodstream. And eventually it will phagocytose or endocytose uh, that bacteria and start to break it down within its cell. Exocytosis is the opposite of this process, and it makes uh, the cell membrane makes little vesicles. They're made by little phospholipid bilayer bubbles, and you can see that fusing with the membrane right now. And it, that's what it does. It fuses with the external membrane, it reconfigures, and it actually pushes out large wastes or proteins or enzymes. Um, now, this is how your body makes digestive enzymes, um, and those kinds of enzymes are made within the cell in the ribosomes and then delivered out of the cell in this way. Excess water can be removed this way as well, um, and you know, little tiny single cellular organisms can actually contract, um, have contractile vacuoles to remove water this way. These are our points. There's quite a lot covered in this lesson, so please make sure you review all of this information.